An image of a boy injured in an airstrike has once again put a face on the war in Syria. Omran Dakhnish has become the symbol of the daily suffering of millions of civilians. But do widely circulated images like his do anything to actually help? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. His name is Omran Dakhnish. The image of him bloodied and covered with dust, sitting silently in an ambulance awaiting help, is another stark reminder of the toll of that war in Syria. Well, modern history is full of similar images of conflicts which have played on the collective conscious of global public opinion long before the internet was of course even invented. But what will this latest one actually achieve beyond short-term outrage? We'll be asking our guests that question in a moment, but first, Paddy Calhane sets up our discussion. The world has seen too many of these videos to recount or much remember. People, children pulled from bombed out buildings in Syria. But this one is different. Children, when injured, are supposed to cry. Five-year-old Amran Dekneesh doesn't. The video is shocking. But it is this, this still picture, that has gone viral. One image that clarifies the hopelessness of the Syrian civil war. It is exactly this kind of image that has changed the world in the past. Images have brought home the horror of war, showed the humanity of protesters, and turned the country against it. Captured a country's struggle and the intense bravery of its people, and cast a worldwide spotlight on a long simmering struggle for rights. It can and has turned opinion against an occupation. But Syria has already produced its share of viral pictures. Abdul al Attar selling pens in Beirut to feed his children. This one picture and a crowdfunding campaign brought in almost $200,000 for his family. And then there was Aylan Kurdi. The image of his tiny body washed up on shore changed the conversation. Dr. Claire Wardell studies social media. After the world saw this, almost instantly people stopped calling them migrants, but instead labeled them as refugees. She believes this latest picture could have an impact. There have been a number of stories to come out around the horrors in Aleppo over the last couple of weeks, but it really hasn't hit mainstream and obviously the Olympics are happening. And I've seen those stories and thought, why isn't there more anger? Why aren't more people thinking about what's happening in Aleppo? And I think what this video will hopefully do is make people stop and say, there's a reason that refugees are still fleeing, but there's also a conflict still occurring and people are suffering every single day. The world reacted to Aylan. The U.S. Fund for UNICEF says its donations increased by 636 percent in the first week after the picture was published. At five years old, Omran has only known war every single day of his existence. The way the world reacts to his picture could determine how much longer he will suffer in eerie silence. Patty Colhane, Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, let's bring our guest into the chat now. We have in London George Graham, head of conflict and humanitarian policy at Save the Children. In Sicily, joining us on Skype, Andrea Calderaro, director of the Center for Internet and Global Politics. And also in London is John Hillary, executive director of War on Want. Welcome to you all. If I could start with George. You work, of course, you're an aid worker. You, you work with some of the most difficult areas in the world where people are in need. Do images like this help, help you to get aid into places which you otherwise would say it would be a lot more difficult for you to do your job? I think in the, the big picture answer to that is yes. I think uh, images like, uh, like uh, this one, uh, they do two things, I guess. They, they elicit more sympathy from members of the public, which elicit funds. But I think more importantly, they do what your previous speaker was, uh, was describing. They make a situation that those of us who follow every day think is surely uh, vivid enough to compel action. They suddenly make it cut through so that 
people in the, in the public, but also, I hope, decision makers really feel that prick of conscience and realize that uh, this is senseless, that life after life after life is being destroyed. And perhaps as a consequence of that, we hope, we will see some of the measures such as the 48-hour ceasefire that the UN has called for that will allow slightly improved aid access. All right, let's take those sentiments to John Hillary. Uh, are we being too optimistic if we hope or expect that this image might be a, a turning point, might be the Mi Lai moment of the Syria war? I think we are being a little bit too optimistic because we've seen such images in the past. And yes, the immediate human response to seeing those images is something must be done. But the problem is, in so many different situations, it's not clear exactly what should be done. And we've got examples from the past where the human outpouring of anger and of sympathy has actually led to some choices which have been the wrong choices. And certainly my organization, War on Want, we've been involved in some of the debates around those going right the way back to the 1970s, where yes, there's been this huge humanitarian response of giving more aid, but the root causes of the problem have gone unaddressed. And in fact, all you've done is you've perpetuated the poverty, the cycle of violence, which has caused those images to come up in the first but place. But John, so hang on, how, how, does more, perpetuate the, issue. how does it perpetuate the problem if, as George was saying, you know, we, we've seen positive outcomes sometimes. Uh, it, some might even draw a connection between the uh, image that's come out of Omran and the fact that now Russia is talking about a 48-hour ceasefire. Um, is that not a good thing and an achievement, even if it doesn't deal with the root causes of the, of the problem? But what is a 48-hour ceasefire in a civil war which has already gone on for years? Let, let me give you an example, maybe more starkly, of where the choice can be made between doing something right and doing something wrong. We saw similar pictures coming out of Gaza with the Israeli assaults back in 2008, 2009. And on the one hand, you had some of the aid agencies saying, all we need to do is we need to get access to bring in humanitarian relief to the besieged people, the Palestinians in Gaza. And there were others amongst us saying, it's not aid that the Palestinians need. They need a just solution to the crisis. They need the Israelis to stop bombing them in these crowded civilian areas. And that's the type of, of response you need. When aid was given, it perpetuated the problem because it basically said to the Israelis, you can continue bombing with impunity and we, the international community, will wipe it all up after you. And that's the problem where you have the wrong response. In, even though it may be well-intentioned, you're just causing the problem to be repeated again and again. All right, well, we'll pick up on those points. I'll, I'll take them back, uh, if I may, to George in a moment. But before we do that, I want to bring Andrea in. You're someone who, who looks very closely at how these images impact social activism, impact government policy. What we're talking about, Andrea, is ima images like this really are the bedrock of social activism, aren't they? They're the things that, that really push social activism forward. Well, I would say I would be optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. So optimistic on a short term because those images are huge impact on the short term. That's why we're discussing about the, 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 the video uh, shot a few days ago in Aleppo. And, uh, and probably these have an imminent impact on probably in ceasefire agreement and so on. But on the long term, what these images really tell us um, I don't know. I mean, uh, exactly. The, 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 the example of, uh, of Alain Kurdi last year um, had a similar situation when everybody had been shocked. So uh, public opinion and the international community uh, were um, shocked to discover, for who were not aware about that, on migration crisis going on. But at the same time, after But hang on, year, Andrea, w wouldn't you say, uh, what would you make, I should say, of those who would argue that maybe uh, the picture of Alain Kurdi didn't solve the Syrian conflict, it did make a long-term change in the lives of, of hundreds of thousands of refugees who were allowed into Europe, into Germany. Um, the pictures of out of Vietnam of a young girl fleeing a napalm attack taken by Nick Ut, some argue helped end the war quicker. Uh, you know, maybe there are long-term effects that we don't measure because we do have a short-term attention and memory span. That's correct. I agree with that. But I, I still have doubts that the, uh, the Vietnam War ended because of that picture. 
and there are many other factors that, of course, uh, brought the end of war, and I expect that many other factors will end the war in Syria at some point, hopefully. But uh, definitely, I mean, I don't think the picture that we, we, we from, uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the Alan Kurdi really had an impact on, uh, on, on policy making, on, uh, on uh, people, who, on the actors that who can actually do something on, uh, on, uh, on not, uh, not war in Syria, of course, uh, on the Syrian conflict, but on migration crisis. Right. And I don't expect, unfortunately, that the picture that we saw a few days ago yesterday uh, is going to have any impact on the on, on long term. All right, so John and Andrea, a little more sceptical about the impact of these images. Let's go back to George for some more optimism, perhaps. And George, what would you make of the argument which I think John was making there? And he didn't actually mention the example, but I, I guess one could look at the money that was gathered to alleviate famine in Africa, in Ethiopia, the Live Aid Conference, and say ultimately, you know, the 1986 spin expose showed that that money may have actually gone to help a dictator buy weapons to perpetuate the conflict. Is, you know, gathering public attention in a very random and unorganized manner and pushing it into, into quick action sometimes counterproductive if it's not well thought out? Uh, well, uh, first thing I want to react to is, is you putting me in the optimistic corner, and, and I'm happy with that. Um, we need some optimism in this show, think... George. So we... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, no, not that I look at Syria and see uh, a great many chinks of light at all, um, but I think that while you have many, many Syrian families trying to, trying to get by in such awful circumstances, they need to retain their optimism in order to get by, and they need those of us who are um, trying to speak for them outside of Syria to retain our optimism. We have to hope that at some point this conflict is going to end. Um, I think to answer your, your bigger question, and I guess um, John's challenge, I think sometimes people overemphasize the impact of humanitarian action on, um, on uh, fundamentally altering the underlying politics. So the way I see my job is uh, I and my organization, Save the Children, as humanitarians, we're trying to uh, alleviate immediate suffering. We, we're not, um, in, in at least when we're acting as humanitarians, we're not um, professing or seeking to change the underlying context. Now, that's not because we think the underlying context is OK. We do not think that the war in Syria is OK. Uh, but we think there is an immediate job to be done, just as an ambulance man has an immediate job to do and doesn't judge why the people he or she is trying to help uh, are in need of help. Um, that said, the premise of this program is to say that sometimes there are images that do transform the debate. Now, what I would say is that uh, that's perhaps human nature, that uh, we are drawn to certain images, that it does shape, it does help frame how we talk about things. It does increase the amount of talking that we do about those things. And then it is a very important job that those people who understand the situation best do their best to make sure that the following conversations, and in particular the policy conversations, are answering the right questions. I agree that you can get it wrong, you can oversimplify, it frequently happens, and that's a problem it needs to be guarded against. But I don't think that that automatically means, therefore, that uh, we, we should avoid telling stories, we should avoid using powerful images. It, you know, I still think that these images, for better or for worse, are the way that we get these conversations started. And it's pretty important that we have these conversations. John, these images may not solve the problem of the war in Syria or famine in Africa, but if the picture, for example, of Ilan Kurdi helped to reframe the whole debate on refugees in Europe. Is it possible that maybe, is there any reason to have hope that maybe this image could reframe the whole uh, perception of airstrikes and what's acceptable to be used in terms of airstrikes? Well, I don't think we need to have an image for people to recognize that if you drop bombs on a civilian population, the net effect is going to be absolutely disastrous. Everybody knows the horrors of war. What I think is important and where there is perhaps a cause for more hope is if you can use images to stimulate the type of political debate, not just a humanitarian response, but a deep political debate as to why we're seeing the repetition of these wars around the whole of the Arab world, around the, the whole of the area where you've seen US and UK intervention from Afghanistan, from the Iraq war. 
that's when you begin to start digging deeper into the problems. You start asking, for example, why it is that the UK continues to provide so many arms and private security and training to the countries of the Persian Gulf, even though they know the net effect of that is going to be to stimulate more war, more conflict, more destability, and all of that. So I think once you can mediate between the image and the political response, that's when you've got an opportunity to, to take the dialogue on away from just terrible responses, something must be done, towards a more profound challenge to the status quo, saying, look, we can't allow these images to be replicated, perpetuated, year after year, generation after generation. We need to have some more fundamental challenge to the root causes that causes them in the first place. Andrea, what is it that makes some... Oh, I could see, actually, John wants to come back in. Let me, let me give you a chance. Go, uh, sorry, uh, George. Go ahead, George, before we go to Andrea. Uh, thank you. I just, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to respond to that. Um, I broadly agree with what John has just said, um, but, I, but I disagree with the very first thing he said, which is um, that the image isn't necessary. I think it really is necessary. Um, you know, when I saw um, the image yesterday, obviously I'm heavily invested in this already, but it just made me have an overwhelming sense of the senselessness of the bombing that's going on in Aleppo, and therefore, by extension, the senselessness of bombing more generally. Um, and the, the, the callousness is, is not quite the right word because it's the lack of interest of the bombers in the devastating effect that they're having uh, that really hit home for me. And one of my very immediate reactions was much as John's describing, can we use this as a vehicle to win the argument against the use of explosive weapons in populated areas, for example, uh, so that this doesn't just have an immediate impact on donations for Syria or perhaps a more medium-term impact on American and Russian calculations over the next few weeks, uh, but actually has a longer-term impact of the sort that John's describing. Well, that comment works perfectly, segues nicely into the question which I want to ask Andrea now. What is it that makes some images more successful than others in impacting, you know, whether it's government policy or the sort of public debate which John was talking about? Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me say that I totally agree with the conversation. So, that, uh, I mean, points right by George and, and, and John. The, um, we need those images. Uh, we really need those images because more images we're going to have and the tanks for digital technologies and social media, and more chance we have to uh, raise attention, awareness of our of, of community, international community. And at that point, what we can expect is that that international community is going to pressure, uh, put pressure on, on uh, leaders, political leaders, who do have actually the, the capacity to take some concrete initiatives. And that's what we call the real-time policy, basically. And that's exactly the impact that digital technologies and those kind of images might have on, on international politics in general and in policy making processes. John, I know you're not the biggest fan of the uh, possible effects of images like this on policy change, but how do governments weigh up public opinion, social media pressure versus what they see as their interests um, when deciding policy? Well, I think we've certainly found through experience over many decades that governments do not take action in response to that type of public pressure unless they feel really threatened by it. I mean, if you think back to 2003 and the start of the Iraq war, millions and millions of people taking to the streets around the world, in London, two million people on the streets, and still the US and the UK went to war and started the bombing of Iraq, which arguably led to so many of the current problems that we're facing. So, so there needs to be something more than just outpourings of public anger. There needs to be an ongoing political dialogue, campaigns, pressure. And that's Who can what provide can that, John? Lead to more Whose responsibility change. is it to provide that? Well, I do think there that part of the responsibility lies with the mediating organizations like War on Want, like Save the Children, the NGOs and the other political forces, which have got a choice here. I mean, if we can put the trenchant, probing questions to our governments and to the other elites, where we say to them, why is it that you are creating the circumstances for the perpetuation of these type of images, then we're actually doing the right thing. And I think that that idea of mediating between the image 
and the political outcomes becomes so important. And that's actually down to everybody. That's down to ordinary people being able to take up the issues with their parliamentary representatives, being able to take up the issues with the local media, actually forcing the pace and mm -hmm. deepening people's understanding of what's actually going on underneath all these images. Because it's only through that greater awareness of the political realities that you're going to get long-term change for the better. I like the expression you used there, John, of ordinary people taking up the issue. George, in the sense of, or in the world of, of aid and relief agencies, have we seen actually that in one sense of ordinary people taking up the issue when that image of Aylan Kurdi was, went viral and we saw people in different ways trying to help out with refugees whether they had boats and, and launching their own sort of coast guard services to pick people up or ordinary people getting in their cars and driving refugees across countries in Europe. Exactly as John was speaking I was thinking about the impact of the island Kurdi photo um, because uh, that did uh, I think as you said in your intro prompt political change, in particular in Germany, to a lesser extent in the UK. Um, I pick up on John's point about the role of the mediating organisations to help shape what that political change looked like. Uh, and in the UK, David Cameron announced that, that the UK would resettle 20,000 Syrians over five years. And there was a judgment to be made by you know, lots of us in the public space about whether we called that a success, because it was progress relative to, to, uh, to where the UK had been at before, or actually a failure, because it didn't really tackle the underlying issues or really significantly increase uh, the UK's uh, willingness to share the responsibility on, a, on the sort of very large scale that, that others might have hoped for. Um, so th there's definitely a fair point there, that how we choose to interpret things uh, is, is highly relevant. Um, but your point was about public engagement. Exactly. So you, you then, as a, I mean, not, enti not solely, rather, as a result of the photo, but I think to quite a large extent as a result of the photo, you got uh, much greater levels of um, popular activism, if you like. It manifested itself in the ways that you've described. It manifested itself in people um, wanting to uh, foster families, which in turn had a political influence, because when the politicians realized that there was an appetite in this country to host Syrians, that changed their calculations a little bit. Right. Um, it changed things in Calais, uh, with lots and lots of volunteers going across there to, to, to help out. So it has made a difference. All right, I think we've just got a couple of minutes. I'm going to try and give it to Andrea now. How about, is there any evidence, Andrea, that images like this can actually empower the victims themselves through peer-to-peer -peer connection, help them to know what's going on and how they can help each other? Any evidence to, to suggest that helps their survival and, and their long-term community resilience? Well, we do have other examples that we didn't uh, discuss here today, which is the, 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 how powerful were the images came out from social media during the Arab Spring. In that case, we do have uh, evidence of uh, how powerful those images were, and this, I mean, in answering your question, um, created community, created uh, actually coll collective awareness about what was going on the street, and, uh, and because of that, probably um, engaged uh, uh, even more people in the, in the protest events and uh, uh, probably, we don't know of course, were made the protest even more successful. All right, we've actually got, I think, 45 seconds. Let me give it to John then. What about fatigue? Is there a, is there a risk that we all get fed up of this kind of imagery? I think people still respond. I think there is still a human response to seeing these awful images, particularly when it's of children like that. But the real problem comes not in people being fatigued, but in not knowing what to do. Because if you've got a response where, for example, you can give £10 and you know it's actually going to solve the issue, then you'll do it and you'll feel it's a good use of £10. If you're actually being asked to give money or to respond in a way which you don't think is going to solve the issue, or if you're presented with something really complex like the situation in the Syrian civil war, that leaves people feeling helpless. And when they feel disempowered, I think that's profoundly dangerous because people just disconnect and they prefer to watch the Olympics because at least there it's all happy and you don't need to worry about the issues. So I think you need to, you need to give people the channels of action which can really make a difference 
give them the political analysis which gets to the root of the problem and then these images can be very powerful forces for change. All right, some very valuable thoughts and suggestions there from all of our guests. Let's thank them very much. George Graham, Andreo Calderaro and John Hillary. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, just head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Well, you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now is goodbye.